In this recording, I want to address the issue of turning the other cheek and blessing those that curse you and to love your enemies. This subject is quite controversial because in the world there is violence and there are people dying as the cause of the violence, also children. So then people think, okay, we are sad to love our enemies, but what about the safety of the victims? Should Is violence ever condoned? We have, we have all those ethical issues that are quite contentious. Now, I want to look at what Jesus said from the wider perspective. All right? What Christ was addressing uh, in that Sermon on the Mount was the attitude that many of the Hebraic people had. They had an attitude, love your friend and hate your enemy. Love your friend and hate your enemy is nowhere found in the Old Testament. So it wasn't something from the Old Testament he was addressing. He also, he was, he was basically addressing the mindset of the people. But it's not meant for us to make though what Jesus said they're absolute and forget all the other things Jesus said. You need to look at the bigger picture of it. Okay, for example, um, let me give an illustration. Let's say that you have a neighbor that can't stand you and he treats you badly. Now that neighbor is in the negative. He is. He shouldn't think bad about you. Neither does he have a right to choose to think bad and especially has no right to seek validation for the for the wrong direction he is going into. So you should not accept this at all. You do accept what is going on in the sense that you accept it's happening. You're not going to deny the facts, but you're not going to agree with the facts, nor are you going to condone the facts. That means you acknowledge what's going on, that it shouldn't happen, and you remain in the positive. You remain in agreement with Christ. Now, so you so when you encounter a neighbor down the street, you smile, you say hi, you say hello, you you don't operate in the negative as he is. Now, this should be enough for that neighbor to back off and evaluate his thinking. Now, if the neighbor begins to call the police on you on a frequent basis, then you need to inform the authorities, in this case the police, what's going on, so that you're not bothered continually by it. If the neighbor goes so far that he is looking up, he's coming after your children and stirring up people against your kids. Now, hold on a minute. You are operating in love. And because you're operating in love, you see there's grave danger now. Your children are not supposed to suffer or go through stuff because your neighbor has some validation issues. So now in the spirit... You pray on behalf of your children, but you also pray against that wicked neighbor of yours. Why? Because there's danger in the community and the danger is growing and the danger needs to be addressed. You're not going to take matters in your own hands. Neither are you going to use witchcraft and curses on, on, on the man. He is in the negative. You're not going in the negative to, to defeat his negative. However, you do take action spiritually. You do. And if things go way too far, you, you move out of that house for safety's reasons. All right? So yes, you have blessed those that curse you. You have loved your neighbor as yourself. You have turned the other cheek. What is turning the other cheek? Turning the other cheek does not mean just allowing things to happen and to be killed. No, turn the other cheek means you evaluate the situation from the wider perspective and you notice what's going on and what's not going on and you take action in order for you to remain in safety without the intent to harm the perpetrator nor the enablers of the perpetrator because those are also involved the enablers so it's not paying evil for evil i've made a video in the past in which i've said that you have to return back all the negative arrows of the enemy and some people confuse this as witchcraft now don't get me wrong in the occult people do similar things jesus said to pray all the time well people in the cult also pray all the time so when you have people from the occult saying you have to pray all the time, and now we have Christ, Christians or I'm saying people that follow Christ that say you have to pray all the time, they both say pray all the time. But the intention of their prayers is completely, di completely different. Are I now going to say that both the occult and those that follow Christ are the same because they all pray all the time? No, you look at the bigger picture. 
Okay? Because, look, Satan counterfeits what God has. And as a counterfeit, there are things that are similar in outworking. Not in outworking. Oh, forgive me what I've said. They are similar in their appearance. The appearance is the outworking we perceive. So because they are similar in appearance, we think, well, it's the same. No, it's not. In order... Okay, let me, this, let me say like this. If you have counterfeit currency, fake money, that you want people to think it's real, you have to make it as real as possible. So, of course, the fake money has to be similar to, 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 to the real money. Or else people are not going to... Or else people are going to spot the difference. And look, there are things that people in the cult are doing in a perverted manner. They're doing things in the cult in a perverted manner that believers ought to be doing in the right, right manner. But a lot of believers, and also most of the world's population, they're following men and not the most high. That's why when they see people from the occult doing stuff, they don't know it's in a perverse manner. They just think that what they're doing is occult. So when a believer does, the, does that thing the right way, how it's supposed to be in the original state, people think, oh, that's witchcraft. No. Okay. Let, let me continue. Jesus. I'm going to say, the, uh, you, you can use the Hebrew uh, version, Yehoshua, or I'm using Jesus now because that's the English variant that people know of. All right, and people have been safe from calling upon this name also. It's the English transliteration, nevertheless, the Most High understands all languages. All new and the languages will come into existence. But okay. Let's say that. Um, no, no, no. Let me look, look, look at what Jesus did. He said, Love your enemies, pay those, pray for those that persecute you and all. When he addressed the scribes and Pharisees, who are his chief persecutors, when did he bless them the way we expect people to bless others? Did he speak kind words up towards them or about them? Did he empower them by decreeing long life and all, and all those blessings upon them? No, he didn't. Why didn't he do that? Did he say, love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you and uh, bless those that curse you? Look, look at this. Jesus operated in the blessing. He operated in the anointing. And because he operated in the anointing, he overcame evil with good. He did not ignore evil. Neither did he go in a, did he went in agreement with evil to deal with evil. He overcame evil with good. So evil was addressed the right way. And a lot of folks, when you address evil, automatically think you're retaliating or you're judging or you're hateful. Those people are, people are deceived. Why didn't Jesus empower the scribes and Pharisees by speaking lovely and, and beautiful words to them? He never did. Okay, let's go to the Old Testament. When Abram, when Abram's um, wife was taken captive into Pharaoh's harem, the Mosai did not bless that Pharaoh at that time. No, he brought plagues on his house to cause him to release Sarah, Abram's wife. Now, that Pharaoh was not aware that Sarah, Sarah was married. Nevertheless, the Lord knew what type of man he was, so the Lord dealt with him in a manner to make him comply to leave Sarah alone. Now look, let's go further about Nimrod. When Nimrod built Babylon and when they were constructing this uh, I would say this tower to build heaven on their own terms. Now, they were operating in an opposition to Christ then, weren't they? Yes, they were. They were agreeing in violence. Now, why didn't God bless Nimrod? Why didn't he bless the Babylonians? He didn't. He brought confusion onto them to hinder their endeavor. Okay, what about David and Goliath? When did David bless Goliath? He didn't. And look, this is what you need to, uh, need to look at. David blessed Saul. Saul, who had no anointing at this time, was demon-possessed. He became a strange psychopath and he killed people. 
all right? And this psychopath was after David's life. David was anointed of the Most High. He was, and it was obvious to everyone, Saul was demon-possessed because Saul was anti-Christ. But now David, David spared Saul's life because David said, I'm not, going, I'm not going to take matters in my own hands and paying evil to evil. That was the right thing of David to do. But David called him father. David had affection towards Saul. Hold on a minute. He was calling Saul the Lord's anointed. No, Saul wasn't the Lord's anointed. David blessed that ending of his Saul and this empowerment of David towards that demon-possessed man, empower that demon-possessed man to keep harming not only David, but more people. Look, when we bless our enemies, we bless by remaining in agreement with Christ. Because look, they are in darkness, okay? The only way for them to have a chance to get out of darkness is if they encounter someone that operates in the light. That means that you make sound judgment in the, in the light also. Blessing your enemies or blessing those that curse you does not mean that you idly sit back and give them the right to be negative towards you or that you just appease them to be so that they are relieved. No, they are agreeing with the negative. That's need to be dealt with. No, it doesn't mean that you are going to do it on your terms. No, you do it on Christ's terms, but it has to be dealt with. I mean, a lot of folks, when they... When they hear you talk about praying against your enemies or praying against demonic strongholds, they think, oh, you need to, need to love your enemies. Hold on a minute. Christ gave his disciples authority to cast out devils. He did not give them the anointing to pray for demons, nor to bless demons, nor to cherish demons, nor to negotiate with demons. But that is what a lot of people are doing. Now look, when you're dealing with other people, you operate in the love of the Father towards them. But you cannot operate in the love of the Father with people that hold on to darkness. That's not possible. That is not possible. So you keep your distance from them. By to, you avoid um, contagious circumstances. This does not mean that when people have taken part of a demonic stronghold, that you now have to allow that demonic strongholds to keep on harming you and others because of the so-called free will of those people. No. Anytime people partake of demonic strongholds, they become the agents of that demonic stronghold. And they are enabling and empowering that demonic stronghold. And that demonic stronghold needs to come down. But, so look, you do walk in love towards other people. You know now that you can't walk in love with other people. You can't. So, you pray and you target that demonic stronghold. And if they choose to defend the demonic strongholds, then the consequences are on them. Look, let's say that you had neighbors who begin to rumor about you, spreading lies about you. You think, well, I forgive them. I don't repay evil, evil. Uh, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Okay. Those other people in that neighborhood that believe those lies of those neighbors of yours, they are responsible for agreeing with those lies and for not evaluating what those neighbors were saying. They are now also, they also don't like you, nor they don't like your family. So now a stronghold has developed against you. And when this happens, there is danger. Now, if you have kids, those children need to be safe. So are you now not going to pray against that demonic stronghold? Are you not going to return back all the psychic attacks that come upon you just so that the free will and the feelings of those perpetrators are spared hello they have endangered you they are endangering your children and they know what they're doing they are in the negative they have to be dealt with so are you going to wait till a third party who's influenced by this bad energy is sexually molesting your kids because look Perpetrators of vile crimes, they are empowered by the community that generates that negativity. In a complete positive environment, perpetrators, perpetrators of vile crimes, they are very uncomfortable. They need a dark climate in order to be um, empowered to do what they're doing. So are you not going to allow the will of those other people to generate negativity on the future of your children? 
and you say, no, I can't repay evil evil. No, you go on the spiritual offensive against those demons, against those strongholds, and upon all those people that are persistent in supporting those symbolic strongholds. Or are you so loving, more loving than the Most High, that you allow negative people and demons to roam around and to defend their rights to roam around and do harm? Are you out of your mind? And there's another thing I want to address here. There are practices that people endorse. If you look at the bigger picture, even without having the Holy Spirit, without the Bible, without Christ, if you just look at the facts from a wider perspective, you wouldn't endorse those, those behaviors. First of all, it is known between adults that physical violence is destructive. People go to the hospital because they were the victims of physical violence. Um, hus when husbands beat their wives, they are, they are imprisoned. Why? Because it can affect, have an effect on the body. And we don't condone that. We don't want that to happen. Okay? But now we have children whose brains are still developing, whose bodies are still are, are very fragile. They cannot defend themselves. And now because a child did something you don't like, as a parent, you have the right to unleash violence against a child. You say it's discipline. Hold on a minute. So it's bad when an adult assaults another adult. It's bad when a man feels hurt and he acts out against his wife against any woman we don't want that see that happen but if the woman is just a girl three four or seven years old then the father has a right to unleash his dissatisfaction from the kid don't you think this is effed up so the brain development of that human being does not matter the validation of the parents is above the safety of the child look if, if you have a child that's running around in the street when there are cars and you grab your child and force them in back inside that's using force physical force to prevent harm okay that's something else but not that you just unleash with a belt with a stick or with your hands come on now i've seen men grown men in their 30s approaching 40s they had a kid of two years old the kid was only a bit noisy and that man it was as if he went to he became a beast and people around him had to appease him because he was about to unleash against a child and people keep defending such men no if you encounter such a man you tell them hey dude oh, what the heck is going on there huh you're losing it against a child and we have to appease you who the, who the heck do you think you are the people have to be frightened because you, you you have a will against something and if a man like that continues to defend his negative will you call the police on on him and he goes to jail and if he wants to return back in the community he has to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist to go into therapy you're not going to allow such a man to be left alone because well he pays the rent of the house he's not feeling kids well so he has a right to harass the kids no he doesn't because those children are growing up becoming adults and are going to be partakers of the community and everyone else will have to deal with the consequences of what that man was doing to those kids so if you, if their wives that permit their husbands do that, they are enabling child abuse. They are enabling the development of narcissism. They are enabling the attraction of demon spirits. Because when children are growing up in a toxic environment, they become they are vulnerable. They can't defend themselves, so they develop wrong taking patterns, wrong coping patterns, and that will attract demons. And those demons will use those people when once they've grown up to uh, to to attack and harass others so those parents are enabling demons so are we now going to give parents the right to enable demons will affect third fourth even fifth parties because it's their privacy their life their will no you don't you don't but a lot of brainwashed people that go to church will defend that a lot of brainwashed people that go to church they enable demons in the name of Jesus. Look, I'm not supporting atheists in their claims that there is no God and all of that. There is no supreme being. But there are atheists. Despite the wrong thing and patterns they have, they're only based on, ma on the material. There are even atheists who have more, who have far deeper insight than most of those church people. I don't like saying this, but a lot of 
people that claim the name of Christ, that claim to follow the Messiah, they are big enablers of wickedness. Why? Because they don't evaluate the way of thinking. In the New Testament, it said we have to renew our minds, but they don't renew their minds. They don't. They seek validation. It's all about self-validation with them. If you had parents that, that you had to look out for, because if their will went bad, then you, you are not safe. And if you have people around you that enable it, then you grew up around people that were cowards. They were not willing to, to address child abuse. They are cowards. That's what they are. And I'm not going to cover it up for you. I'm not going to tell you good stuff about your parents to ease your pain and make you feel good. No, you need to be delivered. I'm not going to relieve you. No, you don't need relief. You need to, be, you need to be delivered so that you will have true relief. But a lot of so-called people that call themselves Christians say, no, you need to honor your mother and father. Even though your father was a wizard, he was possessed with thousands of devils. And still your father, he fed you when you were a kid. So you are obliged to Give them influence and impact upon your life. That's what honor means. There, were, there are preachers saying that. But then I look at what does the word say. The word says to... The word says to separate from people that are seeking to harm you. The word says to, have, to avoid people who have a form of godliness but resist. That means denying the power of godliness. Those are all the things that are written in the word. But now you have people who put pastors, preachers, and, all, and, uh, and even society itself, they put on a pedestal and they submit unto the demands of society. And, and when society uses, the, uses Bible verses, they think, well, God must be behind it because they're using Bible verses. No! If you had a parent who was, if you have a father who was a wizard, because women can't be wizards, women can be witches. If you had a mother who was a witch, you're not going to be evil with evil. You're going to distance yourself from that woman. And when she tries to take revenge on you because she doesn't receive the respect she demands, then look, you just make plain unto her that you're not in agreement with darkness, that you're in agreement with Christ. And if she keeps on going, you break contact. And when you know that she's keep roaming around you, you, pr you decree the protection of the Most High upon you, and you pray against all demonic strongholds and, and against everyone that agrees with those demonic strongholds against you. That includes your mother. You don't have to call her by name if you want, but you are going in on the spiritual offensive in agreement with Christ. The word says in the book of James, submit unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He didn't say, submit unto God, tolerate the devil in love, and things will be all right. No, it says submit unto God. That means agree with the Messiah, agree with Christ. That's the will of the Father. In agreement with Christ, you resist. That means you go against the devil. And as a consequence, when you, in when you are faithful, when you keep when you keep on enduring in faith, the devil will flee from you. But many don't do this. They don't. Some people. Oh man. What I'm saying here may obsess you, but some people, they are on holiday with the devil. Some people, even those that claim the name of Jesus Christ, Satan is walking with them. Say they are chilling, hanging out with the devil. What I mean by that? If you have a community, it, does, it doesn't have to be you that the community had, had victimized. But if you have a community that does not want to face their involvement in the negative that's going on, and you keep on endorsing that community, endorsing their denial, then you are walking with Satan. You're not in agreement with Christ. So you're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not operating in the supernatural. You are enabling the paranormal. Look, we should um, bless those that curse us. Um, we should, um, how would I say, love our neighbor as ourselves. We should do all of that. That's why we ought to understand what Christ meant. Okay? But a lot of people, they hold on to what, the, what society thinks Christ meant. And that's what they're validating. That's what they're in agreeing with. But that's not agreeing with Christ himself. And that's why 
there is so much wickedness going on among believers. Wickedness in the sense that a lot of believers have sicknesses. A lot of some believers even died of cancer and all of that. That's so why you have a lot of bad stuff that keep happening around believers because we're not in agreement with Christ, many of us. And here's what I want you to uh, I want, I want I want to open your eyes to this. People, I'm not about the elite people, I'm not talking about the whole world right now, but elite people that worship Satan, that that follow those demons, they trust those demons. That witch of 20 years old that you see there, she's, she has no intention to harm others. She doesn't. She's just a witch doing her witchy things to get ahead. She trusts what the demons are revealing onto her. When the demon tells her, cut that friend off, she does it. When that demon tells her um, to say hello to that guy over there, she does. When demons tell them to wear short skirts with white underwear behind, uh, uh, under it and to walk a certain sexual way, when demons tell that to those witches, they do it. Even though the witches know that other people, people will look weird at them, that some guys will call them sluts and all because they're operating in a satanic charm and they want the charm to work on their behalf, they trust those demons. Am I praising them for trusting demons? No, absolutely not. What I'm revealing to you is that, why is it? Uh, what I'm trying to reveal is that, okay, sorry, I'm a bit too excited now, now I'm recording this. That's why I, this video is a bit chaotic, I'm sorry. What I'm saying is that those that follow Satan, they put their trust in what Satan is saying. They trust the vision and the dream of Satan. Why is it that believers are striving with the Father? There's, why are they striving with the Messiah? Come on now. I mean, look, this video, I mean, this audio recording isn't just about putting blessing those that curse you in perspective. I also want to reveal to you, as I just did, is that agreeing with Christ means that you're trusting Christ. But to many of you, you're not trusting Christ. And why do you think that people that go to witch doctors, to witches, and all of that, why do you think that on the short term they have success, they get results, they get things done? It's not because they're blessed, not because they're good people, it's not none of that. They rely upon demons and they trust those demons. Those are the type of spirits they should never trust, but they trust them. Why? Because they are craving that validation so much. They are wrong. Don't get me, don't get me, don't get me wrong. I'm not praising them because they are wrong. Absolutely, they are wrong in what they're doing. Yet they're consistent in what they're doing. And many believers are not consistent. They call themselves by the name of Christ, but they agree with a lot of ways of thinking that are anti-Christ. What? Christ said, whoever harms his little children, it would be better if a, if a millstone would be hung around their neck and they've been thrown into the sea. Christ said that. But now you have people that say that parents should smack their children to make to make them respect, to give validation to, to society. Because that's what having respect is all about, giving validation to society. But they don't even evaluate that validation. You just say, well, children have to give validation. And they use Bible verse to support it. It's an abominable teaching of devils. But a lot of believers endorse it and they fight for it. But they claim to follow Christ. Look, if anything does not agree with Christ, I'm not going to empower it. I'm not. That's why, look, there are people that comment on these videos and I have no problem with people commenting but some people ask questions and even in the format of the questions I can see they're not in, in agreement with Christ some people leave comments and complain about stuff and I can see clearly you have the mindset of the world so I'm not going to empower those people some of them are trolls I'm not going to empower them but I keep reacting to them because many of them have no interest in evaluating the way of thinking they just want validation but you know what I'm shaking the dust off my feet from such people or the groups that are doing it and I'll keep focusing on teaching the word of Christ. That being said, be at peace.